Welcome to the Carbon Copy podcast about big thinking local climate action. This mini series, titled Civic Revolution, is a story about how we can change the climate of opinion, adapted from the original book and narrated by its author, Rick Casali. Chapter 6 New Perspectives. In the first two episodes, I looked at why humankind is in such a predicament, and we discovered that the opportunity to change direction lies with us, collectively in the places where we live, as much as anywhere else. In this final episode, we will find the common ground that unites us in action. From sifting our past for clues to how we might change direction, some new perspectives emerge. The first is that people's energy is the fundamental resource that shapes our economy. On the surface, industrial revolutions are about physical energy, muscle, mechanical, electrical, digital. But underpinning these big transformations is the willpower and sheer energy of people to make it happen. This raw human energy circulates in various ways, but always starts at the level of individuals. Imagine a circle surrounded by two outer rings. Individual energy would be the centre circle. It creates the bonds between people that shape our shared sense of identity and belonging, and it's the foundation for trust and cooperation, without which nothing happens. Civic energy is the middle ring. It channels this individual energy by shifting the perspective from person to place from striving against each other to overcome individual problems, to working together to overcome shared challenges. The outer ring is collective energy, encompassing civic energy and the essential contributions of other stakeholders, such as national government and corporations. One outcome from such collective energy would be the regeneration of common resources, such as fresh water and clean air, that could return us to safer spaces within our planet's boundaries. The second perspective is that growth should no longer be the supreme good. As mentioned in the first episode, Earth Overshoot Day is the date when humanity's total consumption of resources for that year exceeds Earth's capacity to regenerate those resources in the same year. It's a moving date, calculated annually, and it's an indication of how quickly we start living beyond our means. In the UK, Overshoot Day in 2023 was on the 23rd of May. Criticism for untamed growth is unfashionable today because it's a direct challenge to the narrative of the goodness of growth. Nonetheless, Overshoot is not a supply problem for technology to solve. The problem lies with us on the demand side. Thirdly, The end goal is regeneration. If the end goal was sustainability, we would not be stepping back from the red lines we've already crossed. We would simply not stray any further into the red. We need to look beyond sustainability to regeneration. If restoration means to put back something which has been broken, then regeneration means to make it better. At some point, the damage has been repaired and something new emerges. For example, reusing, repairing, renewing, refurbishing, and remanufacturing are all activities that extend the useful life of products in a circular economy. And these activities can be regenerative if they lead to the creation of a new resilient system. A vital fourth viewpoint is the importance of rich biodiversity to our well-being. Together, the different plants, animals and microorganisms that we call biodiversity provide our basis for life, ensuring that we have clean air and water, producing fertile soils and all our food, making the raw materials for our clothing and medicines, maintaining wider ecosystems. We are part of nature, not apart from nature, and by destroying this biodiversity, we impoverish ourselves and threaten our very existence. Radical new approaches are needed to rebalance the way we live with nature. We know this and need to think very differently about the importance of biodiversity in our lives, going well beyond traditional ideas 
of conservation of pristine environments. And finally, fairness is the key to a successful transition. Climate breakdown already disproportionately affects Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities in the UK. For instance, by living in neighbourhoods with higher air pollution. Lower income households may also be exposed by policies that ignore the wider social picture. It is quite possible that in addressing the climate crisis, we will increase inequality. In fact, that's the default outcome, given the inertia and the bias of our current system. How we decarbonize, how we shield our communities from the impacts of our changing climate, how we transition our economy. All of these things matter when national change involves the whole of the country, not just part of the country. Chapter 7. Finding Common Ground These perspectives are just as relevant to national government as they are to local communities. Practically speaking, they involve people and organisations investing more time and resources in places to build community wealth. According to popular myth, however, the notion of increasing community wealth is less appealing than personal self-enhancement, because we don't benefit as much. Not true. Modern research refutes this assertion, with repeated studies indicating that good relationships, connections with family and within the community, have more impact on our personal happiness than material and financial wealth. This age-old finding leads to the surprisingly liberating narrative that happiness is much closer to home than many of us think, and doesn't have to cost the earth either. So-called public affluence, represented by great urban parks, free museums, libraries, pedestrian areas, and infinite possibilities for human interaction, also has a positive impact on our health as well as our happiness. Professor Julianne holt Lundstadt conducted a meta-review across almost 150 research studies to determine the extent to which social relationships and connections influence the risk of mortality. Her conclusion is that our social networks are shown to be as powerful a predictor of mortality as common lifestyle and clinical risks, such as smoking and excessive alcohol consumption. It's not uncommon for people to feel very strongly about not smoking, or about drinking less, or about eating some foods and not others. In our attempts to lead healthier lives, building stronger social connections is an equally important lifestyle choice. How much more energy would we put into local community life if we realised that it's also an effective way for all of us to stay healthier for longer? As we know, online social media is a potent force that can help organise and amplify social life and strengthen community ties and participation. However, galvanising others into action is not so much about how effective we are at using technology for our message, but the message itself. And here's the paradox. The more you ask of people, the more likely they are to become involved. Far more people are willing to step up if you ask them to do something big to gain something big than if you ask them to do something small to gain something small. So what does big look like? Protecting those elements of our environment that are held in common and accessible to all, such as air and water, forests and fisheries, is clearly something big. These commons, as they are known, belong to everybody and to no one. That is their strength and their weakness. Not all of them have to be huge. They can range in scale from the high seas and the atmosphere to the local green space in your area or city centre. The tragedy of the commons is a misconception first published by biologist Garrett Harding back in 1968. He argued that any common resource would always be overexploited because individual gain outweighs the loss to the common good that everyone suffers as a result of its overuse. A classic case of free riding 
and of enjoying the benefits without paying or sharing the costs. The real tragedy is that his story of free riding is still believed, despite being thoroughly debunked by political economist Eleanor Ostrom and other thought leaders. A true commons consists not only of a common resource that a community shares and over which it has equal rights, but also of a community that organizes itself to manage and protect that resource. Traditional commons, such as shared pastures and managed fisheries, work precisely because they are closely regulated by the people who share them. The winning approach is to set up cooperative institutions that are organized and governed by the resource users themselves. New commons are then created by reclaiming the rights over natural resources that belong to no one and protecting them within a cooperative community of users. This kind of community ownership of resources is growing all the time, from community-owned coastal marine reserves to peatland restoration to renewable energy to low-carbon housing with each organisation contributing directly to community wealth building. This collective effort goes even further because it unites communities as both the beneficiaries and the guardians of the common resource. Actions like these embed people both in their natural environment and in the lives of others to the benefit of everyone involved. Chapter 8 a world in common. The generations of the past, separated by age group, have been variously labelled baby boomers, Gen X, millennials and Gen Z. The big difference in today's climate change generation is that it doesn't simply refer to young people. The climate change generation refers collectively to all of us who are alive today. Everyone contributes to climate breakdown And so we all hold some responsibility and some power. This realization that together we can do something about the climate crisis can be very empowering. Taking individual action to be more sustainable in our everyday lives is absolutely worth doing. And if everyone did it, the positive impact from the sum of all these individual changes would be massive. What follows does not change that. It's just that personal lifestyle changes are not enough for real structural change. The good news is that most of the solutions already exist. To quote William Gibson, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. It's up to us, together where we live, to copy what's working. Take renewable energy, for example. There are around 300 community energy organisations in England alone, ranging from small-scale solar rooftop projects to large commercial-scale wind and solar farm developments. Community energy initiatives generate not just electricity, but social energy too. Each project gives local residents new reasons to engage with each other. Solar PV arrays on social housing blocks in inner city areas can generate valuable community funds for residents. And the connected approach undertaken by so many community-owned energy projects means that fuel poverty and employment and mentoring opportunities for young people are also provided for at the same time. Or take the example of a local circular economy with its wide range of community-led initiatives that are designed to save money for residents while reducing waste. From library of things to swap shops to repair cafes. There are over 150 repair cafes across the UK already that offer everything from tools and materials and workshops that help people repair their own stuff to repairing the items that people bring from clothes to furniture to electrical appliances. The motivation for setting up or participating in a repair cafe comes as much from not wasting money as from saving the amount of waste that goes to landfill. Take local food production as a third example, embraced by over 250,000 allotment holders in England and Wales. These open green spaces for growing fruit and vegetables play an important role, especially in our urban areas. 
In addition to the undisputed personal health benefits from the physical activity involved, allotments have been shown to improve local climate and air quality, flood management, and also water purification. Allotments also feed community spirit and contribute towards a healthier neighborhood as plot owners help each other out with advice and gifts of seeds or spare produce, as well as donating their surplus seasonal crops to local food charities. These are just three examples of collective action. Our charity has gathered over 1,000 climate action stories told by the inspiring people involved, young and old, from different backgrounds and places covering all four corners of the UK. In the far north of Scotland, Reflex Orkney is pioneering an entire low carbon energy system for all the islanders. Off the Pembrokeshire coast in Wales, Seagrass Ocean Rescue is helping to restore the UK's lost seagrass meadows. In Cornwall, Farm Net Zero is a major project by the farming community to show the contribution that agriculture can make in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. In Northern Ireland, Forests for Our Future is leading the way in creating 9,000 hectares of new woodlands. In addition to all that the thousands of local initiatives achieve directly, they also send a strong political message to regional and national leaders about what voters think is important. And in our connected world, the wider impact of well-publicized collective local action should not be underestimated. From the breadth and diversity of community-led actions that have been shared with us, some very important observations stand out. Firstly, community action doesn't need to focus on carbon reduction to have a positive climate impact. The possibilities and the motivation for getting involved are often more varied. For example, climate change matters to our health and tackling something like poor air quality from emissions has a direct benefit to our well-being. A second observation is that a community-powered response demonstrates how it's possible to improve the quality of life in many different kinds of places by addressing economic and climate goals together locally. For example, creating better neighborhood cycling routes improves people's quality of life as more of us feel safer pedaling around on less congested streets. Another reflection is that community initiatives are not merely a way for people to become active and achieve a clear goal, important as that is, they also combine, connect, and translate different societal values and social factors. This ability of unlocking and amplifying the power of social diversity is unique to big thinking local action. And finally, we have learned that joining in such action is compelling to so many people because it strengthens the ability of their own community to shape the things around them that matter and for those who participate to make the most impact. I'd like to leave you with one final thought. It's not hard to reimagine the possibilities for greater well-being and enjoyment by being part of something greater than us. With that in mind, perhaps the most effective thing that anyone can do right now, as an individual, is to think of themselves a little less as an individual. So, where does this leave you? If no one has invited you to join in the action in response to the climate crisis or to help protect nature locally, then please consider this your warm welcome. And if no one has thanked you for your efforts, please accept our thanks. You are so needed now, together with others, where you live. If you've enjoyed listening, send a link to this podcast to someone you think would like it. And if you haven't already, click follow this podcast wherever you're listening right now. Before you go, don't forget to visit carboncopy.eco and discover a thousand inspiring climate action stories from around the UK.